Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be taking another look at this Amiga 500 that was generously donated to the channel by CRG Glenn. Now, you'll recall in my last video, we took this from a very dingy and yellowed condition all the way back to its factory fresh finish today, and then it stopped us in our tracks by breaking down. Now, I'm pleased to reveal we've overcome that little problem and this machine is now fully working, and I'll explain a little bit about what went wrong shortly. And then we'll get on to the actual point of the video, which is what upgrades can we throw at an Amiga 500 in 2025 that are essential for modern living? Let's crack on. So for the benefit of those that didn't watch that previous video, let's quickly go over what the problem was. Initially working, our machine failed to boot properly following a cleanup it just sat at the kickstart ROM screen waiting for us to insert a floppy disk. Except we had inserted a floppy disk. The machine just didn't acknowledge that it was there or trying to utilize the floppy drive at all as it would transpire. Now the floppy drives on an Amiga are connected to the system via the CIA or complex interface adapter, a marvelous chip which basically connects all the peripherals for the system to the rest of the custom chips that make up the Amiga as a whole. The A500 contains two such chips, and both are needed for the floppy drives to function properly. Initially, I thought there was some sort of issue with a dodgy solder joint or socket connection, but after reflowing everything and cleaning extensively, our fault didn't change. As it transpires though, the problem wasn't with the CIAs at all, or at least, it wasn't initially. You see, pin 34 on the CIAs is used to reset them upon boot by supplying a 5 volt signal. And as you can see, we are getting a constant voltage here, but it's only around 3.9 volts, which apparently isn't enough to trigger the reset. We can prove that to be true because all of the port pins on the top side of the chip are reading 5 volts, which is their default state when not reset. So where is this 5 volt generated? For that, we need to venture over to the right-hand side of the board to U37, which is a 74LS32N logic chip, essentially four OR gates in a single package. This should output our 5 volt signal on boot up from pin 11 here, but if we measure our voltage, you can see it's the same 3.92 volt signal we saw at the CIAs. Interestingly, if we look at the input voltage on pin 14, you can see that we do have 5 volts, and it's a much cleaner signal than is output on pin 11. So it's some sort of failure with this chip itself, which is preventing the output voltage from being correct. So I whipped that chip out, and a few days later, a replacement chip came in the post. And while our input voltage at the reset pin was definitely fixed, it looks like that poor signal has also damaged the CIAs. So I went ahead and replaced those as well. And yeah, we're back in business. Right, should we get on with it then? So on to the actual point of this video. I want to install some upgrades in this machine that make it more usable in 2025. And for the most part, with one small exception, everything we're going to do is an external upgrade. We won't be soldering anything onto the system board and we'll only be venturing inside to install a PCB, which will then stay in place permanently. We started in the last video with a RAM expansion unit. Now, I could have just gone ahead and soldered additional RAM chips and some capacitors directly to this Revision 6A system board, but I decided to go instead with a clone of the original A501 RAM expansion model, which gives us the same extra 512 kilobytes of RAM via a trapdoor expansion. Before we continue, I want to let you know that this video is sponsored by PCBWay. I use PCBWay for all my PCB needs, and the service I've received has always been quick, cheap, and of a high quality. Simply upload your Gerber files and select the options that suit you, and PCBWay will give you an instant quote. They also have a fantastic project library, many of which include a bill of materials so that, if you want to, PCBWay can source the parts to construct the PCB for you. What's more, the project owners are paid a commission each time you order their design, so it's a great way to support independent creators. Order yours today at PCBWay.com. This is a project from the PCBWay project library, and it's a relatively simple design that will get our stock Amiga 500 up to a full megabyte of RAM. 
we just have a bank of resistors over here on the left, a small ceramic capacitor in line with each RAM chip to help smooth the voltage being supplied, and then we have RAM sockets for each of the four RAM chips. We then need to solder on a toggle switch to turn the RAM expansion on and off, and then a connector on the edge to allow it to be connected to the Amiga via the trapdoor slot. The connector on the side is 56 pins arranged in two rows of 28, but no one makes a 56 pin connector, so I went with a 40 pin one and then cut down a second connector to make up the rest. It took a little bit of doing to get all the pins lining up, but they're close enough that there should be no issue connecting this to the trapdoor slot on the Amiga. We just slot this into the underside, power on the machine, and we can immediately take advantage of all those games that needed a full one megabyte of RAM, like Zool, which you can see here loads and plays just fine. So with that installed, we have an Amiga that can load pretty much any games designed for the A500, but we still rely on booting those games from floppy disks, which in 2025 is becoming more and more of a risk as floppy disks and even the drives themselves begin to wear out and fail. There is an answer to this problem in the form of the GoTek USB floppy emulator, which allows you to copy ADF or Amiga disk files to a USB stick and play them directly from there. And I could just go ahead and install one of these in place of the original drive and load games purely from USB. In fact, I've done this with my Amiga 600, and it does work quite well, although it's certainly not the prettiest option. So instead, I want to use a GoTek externally. To do that, I've picked up this external floppy drive from my friend Fuzzy Lee. This is just a standard 720 kilobyte drive inside an external enclosure with the power and data pins mapped over to a D-type connector for the back of the Amiga. But seeing as the GoTek is designed to be a straight swap out with a standard floppy drive, we can remove that drive and insert the GoTek here instead. That's not a bad color match. It almost looks factory, save for the dissolved rubber feet. I'll get the three remaining feet off now and replace those with some fresh ones so it doesn't rattle around the desk too much. With that done, we should be able to connect our GoTek drive up to the Amiga and use it as an external drive, which presents us with our next problem. You see, the Amiga 500 will only boot from the internal drive. So to get it to boot from our GoTek, we're gonna have to delve back inside the case and modify it internally. You see, Matt, this is why you don't screw everything back together until you've finished. The drive allocations on the Amiga are handled by the pin allocations on one of those CIAs. So the only way to get the drive allocations to change is to remap those pins. You can do this with a simple breadboard and a toggle switch, but to keep things a bit neater, we'll be taking advantage of a project from the PCB Waste Shared Project Library. This drive switching adapter sits neatly sandwiched between the original CIA and its socket and allows for switching of the relevant pins so that an external drive is seen as the internal one and vice versa. If you just connect it like this, then the contacts will be switched so that DF0, that's the internal drive, and DF1, the external drive, are switched, meaning that your Amiga will boot from an external drive while also recognizing the internal drive as an external drive. Still with me? Good. Or if you want to be able to choose which drive your machine boots from, you can connect a toggle switch to the contacts on the side of the board, and the orientation of the switch will determine which drive is bootable. So you can have it as a stock Amiga in one position, and with the drive assignment switched in the other. It's a really elegant design, with just a 40-pin socket on the top and a couple of rows of pin headers on the bottom to connect it to the socket on the system board. And then we just have a small logic chip which handles the pin conversion, along with a couple of small passive SMD components and a header for the switch to be connected to. All in, this project only set me back about £1.70 per board, and I knocked a few up to organize a group buy with members of the Retro Hardware Discord server. If you're into retro technology and the community around it, then come and join in the conversation with us via the link in this video's description. So anyway, our original EVEN CIA goes into the socket on the top, which is in no way difficult to film. 
and then we drop the whole thing into the original CIA socket. And then we can just go ahead and connect a toggle switch to the pin headers for an initial test. Well, the good news is our Amiga still boots. And with the switch in its current position, the Amiga will continue to boot from the built-in floppy drivers we would expect. And here we have the loading screen for Lemmings as evidence. But if we power the Amiga off and then toggle the switch, and then power it back on, we can see that we're now booting from a cracked version saved as an ADF file on the USB stick. And if we look at the front of the GoTech, you can see it reading up the tracks on the disk image file. As Lemmings needs a second disk to load the game, we just turn the dial on the GoTech to the second image file, and with a click on the mouse, the game continues to load. So that's all fine and dandy. We just need to find a way to mount a toggle switch without cutting into the case. And for that, I've broken out Tinkercad and modified an existing 3D model for a GoTech display housing on an A500, and come up with a passable design that allows us to position our switch on top of the Amiga without having to cut any holes. I needed to solder a longer lead onto the switch than the one I used for testing, so I grabbed this old piece of wire, which I think was from a PC speaker, and fed the leads through the top of the RF shield so that I could solder the ends onto the switch. I just needed to trim down the solder tabs on the switch first, as they were a little bit tall for the enclosure I printed, but we're still able to get a decent connection even with the truncated solder points. The switch I bought had a shaft around 6mm in diameter, so I printed my enclosure with a slightly larger hole so that I could use a washer and a nut to secure it in place. I've made this design available on Thingiverse, with and without the hole in the center, just in case you wanted to modify it yourself for a different type of switch. I then connected a couple of DuPont cables to the headers on the drive switcher, and made sure these fed through the keyboard connector hole when I put the RF shield back on, this way, I can connect and disconnect the switch without having to take the RF shield off each time. So, nothing left to do now but to finally screw this Amiga back together and call this one a day. But not before we quickly retrobrite the trapdoor cover, which I definitely didn't forget to do in my earlier video. But thanks to the magic of filmmaking, it's now done and matches the rest of this machine perfectly. I also took the opportunity to replace the dodgy rubber feet on the bottom with new ones, and as a gentle reminder to myself that I will never have to open this machine up again to modify it, we'll stick some custom security seal stickers on the bottom as well. And there we have it, guys. I'm so sorry this one took so long. It's an unfortunate predicament with these older machines that sometimes they just fail at the most inconvenient of points. But I'm very happy that we've managed to return this one to full working order. I really couldn't be happier with how this has turned out. With the RAM expansion, the GoTech, and the DF drive switcher, we have a machine that is now ready for use in 2025, that can play anything designed to work on an Amiga 500 without having to resort to 40-year-old floppy disks. But what would you have done differently? Are there any Amiga projects out there that I don't know about? Are there things that you would have done differently to this Amiga to make it more usable in 2025? Let me know in the comments, and I'll be sure to read every one. And if I like your idea, it may even feature in an upcoming video where we'll take this machine to the extreme. And that's it for this video. If you've enjoyed it, there is a button explicitly for that. And if you want to see more of this sort of content from me, you can subscribe by the button on your screen now. Other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.